talking about white string quartet number two. I'll be going back and forth because the clicker doesn't really work. So this is one of my teachers from Mills College, and he said these two quotes that kind of um, encapsulate how I like to compose myself. So Roscoe Mitchell says, I've always been interested in shaping music in odd ways with odd riffs, and that's been probably something that I've continued on with my studies with improvisation as I'm working with people. And also, I like to box myself in when I'm composing. So a little about me, I'm a composer, pianist, film composer, sound artist, improviser, educator. Um, I also play in a synth pop, canary pop band, Telepathic Birds. Um, some of my influences, uh, just because I have to pay homage to all my influences. These <laughs> 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 are just the very few of my influences, but you know, Bartok, Stravinsky, Sarajevo, Shostakovich, Libby, um, J.S. Bach, um, Bjork, Brian Eno, uh, David Bowie, and so many more. <laughs> Um, so this is the table of contents. Um, I'm going to be talking about what is a string quartet, like really briefly, kind of an overview of the piece, um, how I compose the piece, and then I'm going to do kind of an in-depth analysis of, oh, I put string quartet number one, that should be string quartet number two. <laughs> and then we're going to watch and listen to the whole thing, and then I'll answer any questions. Um, so what is a string quartet? So it's basically a music ensemble that consists of four string players. You have two violin players, a viola and then a cellist. Um, and this was a very popular ensemble um, from the mid-18th century and onwards. Um, and this is just kind of the range of each of the instruments. Um, so kind of how I composed the piece. Uh, in the very beginning, I kind of look at, you know, what's going on in my life, what energies am I kind of working through, or challenges, or life things I'm kind of grappling with. Um, and I try to use that in my composition. I try to think of what's some sort of, um, you know, some sort of narrative or something that can help direct what I'm composing. So I also like to improvise uh, the piano. I'll, uh, you know, kind of take an idea and just see what, you know, what, what can I kind of come up with. Um, I also like to meditate, uh, you know, going past the ego to kind of access the deeper creative realm. Uh, and I like to study other films and music. Especially horror films, that's what I really kind of studied when I was working on this piece. Just the narrative of, of this kind of building tension and, you know, this momentum. And uh, so I was really, you know, watching a lot of horror films as well. So the structure, you know, I've always tried to not really address structure in the beginning of when I'm composing. But I'm realizing that it, it, um, structure can actually be a very powerful compositional tool. So not using structure to kind of fill in a form or anything, but how can I, how can the form actually help the ideas, um, you know, take off in their own way? And I actually, you know, I studied form and architecture, films, life experience, uh, books, drawings, shapes, just to get ideas for how I would structure my own string quartet. Uh, so I, ideas would come in fragments. Um, I didn't, you know, like Mozart who would compose, you know, from beginning to end, it was not like that at all for me. It would just get, I would get little fragments of ideas, and I would just write down those ideas, and slowly it was kind of, you know, how do I, um, you know, the next part is like, how do I kind of link these different parts together? How can they kind of, you know, be different chunks in a story, or, or even like, um, you know, like the next part, identity of the piece. What are the main themes, the ideas, characters of the piece? So I would often plant seeds in the beginning, you know, like a little motive or some sort of character. Um, and then how would that kind of develop throughout the piece? Um, and sometimes uh, I try to tell more than one story at once. This is a very common um, compositional technique where you would kind of have different characters kind of going on or different scenes going on in the um, piece. And then how would those stories or characters kind of meet or interact or collide at the end. Um, this is kind of like similar to the structure of like a soap opera. Um, and then maintaining momentum. This isn't actually talked about a lot, but you know, I had a lot of my teachers were talking about like energy in a piece, the flow of the story. How much mileage can you get from you know one or two main ideas instead of you know 
being all over the place and introducing this character and this character and this motive and this thing and this thing and then just a bunch of too many ideas. It's like how do you stick to one kind of thing? Um, so these are kind of like different elements of the harmonic language that I would use. Um, kind of my two main characters in um, which I kind of thought in terms of like film, uh, glissandi, and also 16th note chromatic runs. And I would kind of stick to this four note, you know, D, D sharp, E, and F, this kind of four note sonority. Um, and then also, you know, use intervals. I especially, you know, a big Bartok fan, and he was into the minor seconds, minor ninths, and minor sevenths. Um, and then some of the gestural language I used in the piece were kind of pocketing and asymmetrical rhythms. Um, and I used string textures. So glissandi, tremolo, clusters, pizzicato, some Bartok pizzicato, uh, double stops. Um, I was using you know, an ostinato and then also register spacing, like how to uh, space out the instruments from each other, like whether they're in close range or um, far apart. So the beginning section is kind of, it's called Allegro uh, Molto Agitato. So this is kind of where the themes kind of present themselves. Uh, number two, section number two is kind of the development. Although I kind of, this form is very kind of, uh, it's not very strict, but it's kind of like what I, what I kind of deciphered from my piece after writing it. Um, so the section two is kind of where I explore the motives further. And it's kind of episodic in nature because I feel like it kind of goes on a tangent a little bit. Um, and I kind of take the theme and I kind of break it into fragments and stuff like that. Uh, section three is heavy and not too fast. So this is kind of like the section that's like building momentum. And this is like the transition section that's kind of uh, leading to the last section, which is the heavy and lyrical section, um, where the motives reappear more frequently and things, worlds collide, these motives kind of work together and repel each other. Um, and then it leads to a climactic ending so I should say also that this is just the first movement in a four movement string quartet. And actually I'm in the middle of trying to finish um, the fourth movement because it's the whole thing's going to be performed in about a month um, with another string quartet, the Del Sol string quartet. So this is just the first movement that, I'm, that I decided to analyze. Okay, so we're going to look at the score. Um, so I like to use color. <laughs> and, so you can see in the very beginning, everyone kind of uses that four note motive, that chromatic D, D sharp, E, and F motive. Um, and the glissando, you know, and the two violins, the tremolo and the viola and uh, cello. And then you have a variation of that four note motive, um, which I can play on the piano really fast. So. I'm using for um, that uh, chromatic and then so you're gonna hear that that kind of uh, kind of a variation of that chromatic motive okay and then this is the second page um, you'll see more of this kind of motive and how it's you know, displaced in like a, you know, so one instrument plays with another, another, so, and then they all come together. So those are kind of different um, ways of presenting this motive. Um, and I like to kind of use the violins together. I feel like it kind of gives the voice a very strong, like, strength um, of character to it. Um, so it's kind of like the two violins and then the cello and um, viola are kind of teaming up together. So lots of this very um, messing with the rhythms, trying to get as much mileage as I can out of um, these four notes. And I should soon expand out of it, of course. Um, so yeah, there's that motive again at the very top. You have these chromatic runs. And notice sometimes they're descending, sometimes they're ascending. At this point, you have a section two. Um, and so this is kind of like where things kind of get explored further. Stuff gets fragmented further. Yeah, so this is kind of more fragmentation of this motive. And then the cello is kind of providing a harmony. So if I get everything very 
you know, hawking with lots of rhythms that are always changing. It actually made, I actually did that in the beginning before I changed it, but it was just like the piece didn't feel like it was moving forward. There was just too much rhythmic stuff going on, busyness. And so by adding some sort of harmony, it actually helped propel the piece forward more. Um, so this is what is being developed, kind of gaining momentum right here. Um, yeah, so same thing here, we have the fragments of the motive, uh, building up intensity, cello still kind of adding more harmony, double stops, um, kind of more leaping. I know the violins are not very happy with me. It was actually, I had to rewrite some parts because it was very difficult. Um, sometimes they were crossing over three strings, and I changed all of that so they wouldn't have to deal with that. But um, you know, I just I really like that octave, augmented octave minor second sound, and so um, that tends to be something I tend to uh, go towards. And also, as a piano player, I tend to write from the piano, so it can make it very uh, challenging sometimes. Um, okay, so this is kind of a transition. This is kind of built up. And then we're going to transition to the next section. Um, we have the pizzicato in the um, viola and cello, kind of back and forth. Okay, so section three, this is kind of the 5 8 section. And this is where things are this is the ostinato is introduced in the cello and the viola. And then this is another kind of variation of the motive, but it's in 5 8. And this is kind of an interesting rhythm because the the uh, bottom two voices are actually five eight, and this is kind of more in like a I guess you could say it's more like a four four time kind of feel. So it's like the rhythms are kind of um, they don't quite line up, which is kind of sounds really cool, but it's hard to play. <laughs> um, all right, so here I'm reading. Um, just more of uh, double stops in the violin one part, creating more dissonance, um, octaves, I'm using augmented octaves, uh, minor nights, um, and then it kind of reaches this uh, high point and then it kind of comes down. We have this tremolo bliss, and this is gonna lead to the final section, which is kind of the lyrical heavy part. Um, bringing back the motive, and you have the cello and the viola kind of providing this harmonic backdrop. And this is where you know you have that chromatic run going on, and it's a little more aggressive this time. It's a little more not uh, verbatim as it was in the very beginning. It's kind of more scattered. Um, and then you have the that variation of the motive kind of in octaves, kind of against the original motive. So yeah, the very, when I first wrote this, I was having everyone kind of do this like crazy rhythmic stuff. And I was like, why is it not moving? And it's because there needs to be some sort of harmony. Because harmony kind of tells us you know, where we are and where we're going. So it gives us a, a, a feeling of being at home and then being away from home. So I definitely wanted to um, have both of those elements. OK, so. Here we are, uh, this variation of the motive gets traded off um, in the two violin parts. And then you have more fragments of this kind of chromatic four note motive. Uh, texture becomes more busy, as you can see. And yeah, I have a moment, there's a moment here where they're all kind of playing for casing on. It's just like a moment where they kind of, it gives you a little break from all this uh, rhythmic texture that's going on but then it goes right back to it. Okay, so this continues. Uh, counterpoint builds energy. Uh, the lines are ascending. And again, you have this, this theme right here. I didn't mark all of the motives just because it would have been just way too much to look at. Um, but same thing is going on here. You just have the counterpoint in the lower voices and then that kind of chromatic fragment motive in the upper voices. And then this is kind of the, the ending, and you still have that kind of descending four note um, motive um, while the other, and it's kind of like they kind of gradually add up and it's just holding a minor sonority. 
So it's just this uh, really um, grand moment where everyone kind of finally gets to rest on one note <laughs> instead of, you know, moving all around. So we're going to listen to this piece. And so this was performed um, last month. And I'll just play it. How do they kind of interact with each other and how 
you know, if they were presented kind of in their own separate worlds, how did the worlds kind of collide at the end? That was what I was kind of going for, is like they're kind of two separate things that are kind of repelling each other, but then they kind of come together at the end. And just from hearing the performance, I did make a few revisions, just some of those high notes, I actually asked them to, you know, just make them scream, <laughs> you know, because I like that Bernard Herman kind of, uh, <laughs> you know, it's just going for, going for it. Uh, but I did do some revisions to it just because there's a, not a lot of room when you get up that high as far as getting the pitch accurate. So that was one of the challenges I, I had to, uh, you know, kind of work out, I guess. So, yeah, so does anyone have any questions? What is the Bartok Pizzicato? So this one, they, they snap the string. It actually, I realized I didn't use it in this one. It's in the next movement that I use it in. So they, they pluck the string so hard that it actually hits the, the board. Slap back. Yeah. Ooh. Yeah. Was there any uh, thought process behind the pitch material that you chose? So I was influenced by a lady's Musica Ricercata, where he limits himself to one note. He just, you know, for his piano pieces, he, his first one is like just for A's, his second one like for A and B flat. So I actually was writing a bunch of piano etudes that were similar to that. And so my piano etude number four was inspired, or this piece was inspired by my piano etude number four, which was inspired by Ligeti's Music Cover Circata. So if you want to hear that piece, it's, it's on YouTube, and it's, I would say, it's, it's a little bit different. I, I had to make this one a little more gentle, just because uh, this is uh, <laughs> four people working together versus one person. So. I'd like to ask a question. Um, I mean, I love both the Bartok's and the Yeti's music. Um, and they come, they're sort of rooted in the, in the folk music that's been abstracted to their musical language. Um, besides your, like, more like, what is your, like, personal, you know, how do you see you know, being able to profit from your own roots and then through your, like, fascinations and, and then, like, really, you know, pushing that, that thing through rather than borrowing right, right. somebody else's heritage. Right, yeah. So I, my background is in film scoring and I also have done a lot of experimental electronic music. Mm -hmm. um, I feel a lot of my stuff is a mixture of things and this is, you know, this is only my second string quartet that I'm, so I feel like every time I'm doing more, like, um, for me it's like limits, you know, how can I limit myself? Um, but I'm always trying to bring in, you know, you know, like the world of film scoring. How how can that be brought in as well as, uh, you know, my my um, interest in electronic, experimental electronic music. But yeah, I think that like you know, in the very beginning when you're composing, it's like you do sound like your influences because it's like that's all you've been listening to. You know, Schnitka, Bartok, Stravinsky, Ligeti. And so, like, there's going to be this, like, it's like it feels like there's chunks of this and this and this in here. And so, I think that's kind of part of the learning process. And then, you know, as as you kind of develop your voice more as a composer, it's like you kind of, you know, become less. It's less fragmented. It, it just comes from your own, your own essence. Thank you, Fiona, so much.